Please be seated. Grace and peace, love and mercy from God our Father, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Text for our meditation this evening, the gospel reading that we heard a moment ago from Mark chapter 6, especially these words. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to think about the last birthday party that you attended. Think about the things that were there, the trappings that were there. It's pretty easy for me because I attended one this afternoon. My mother, 94, still lives at home. I want you to think about some of the things that are kind of common to birthday parties and celebrations, right? Because the bulk of our text is about a birthday party. A birthday party for the king. What do you have when you have a birthday party? You have cake. You have candles. You have presents. You have guests, family, and friends, and maybe some special dignitaries that are there. Maybe you have a little uh, political intrigue. A little sexual deviancy. Pole dance or a lap dance. Top the night off with a murder. You see, there are some things about this particular birthday celebration that are different, that are unusual, that cause us to take notice. Because at the end of the night, the celebration is a celebration of death. Right at the beginning, we see that this, this text, well, it talks about John the Baptist. It talks about the murder of John the Baptist. It talks about Herod and his wife Herodias and all of their crazy wild stuff. This text is really about Jesus. Jesus. King Herod heard of it. For Jesus' name had become known. This is about Jesus, and it's about the identity of Jesus. Jesus has been doing all kinds of Jesus things. Healing the sick, raising the dead, preaching and teaching the word of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And people were taking notice. Even Herod. Herod heard about it. And everybody is talking. You know, at the coffee shops. On their, on their instant messaging and their Twitter accounts. Who is this guy? Who is this Jesus? And they couldn't come to a conclusion. Who is this Jesus? Well, maybe he's one of the prophets. We haven't had a prophet in hundreds of years. About time, right? Maybe he is the great prophet. Elijah, who's going to come and usher in the way for the kingdom of God, the Messiah to come. Everybody is talking back and forth about the identity of Jesus. But Herod knows. Herod knows in his mind because he has been haunted. Haunted with what he did. This must be a ghost. This must be a demon, this Jesus. It must be John the Baptist, raised from the dead, coming to haunt me in my dreams. And then in typical Hollywood fashion, right here in Mark chapter 6, we have a flashback to what King Herod did that would make him think such about the identity of Jesus. It was a birthday party. Started out like a birthday party, pretty much like the ones we celebrate. But there were some strange characteristics. You see, King Herod called himself a king, but he wasn't really a king. He was the king wannabe. He was a pretend king. He was a tetrarch 
one of four people who ruled, and each one of these four guys claimed to be the king. Herod wasn't really a king. He wanted to be a king. He thought he was a king. And years and years later, when he went to Caesar Augustus and asked to be the king, he was banished into exile and never heard from again. His wife is Herodias. Now here's where it gets a little complicated. Are you ready for this? Herodias is his niece. And she used to be his sister-in-law. So Herod married his niece, who had been married to his brother, and she divorced his brother because she thought Herod was going to go farther politically than Philip. Wow, what a mess. There's nothing new under the sun. You thought sexual de deviancy was, was really kind of new around here? No, no, no. Same old, same old. And we have John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. That faithful proper prophet of God who is Elisha, the forerunner paving the way, proclaiming the way for the true Messiah, Jesus. And John knew what was going on. He knew that this fake king had broken God's law again and again and again. And he did the unthinkable. He preached repentance to King Herod. King Herod, you're wrong. This, this sexual sin is wrong. Divorce is wrong. Repent because you're on a fast track to a very hot place. Herodias, she did not like John for obvious reasons. She felt guilty. And the best way to deal with her guilt, she thought, was to stop the message. Well, guess what? You can't stop the message unless you stop the messenger. Get rid of him. And she convinced her husband, the current husband anyway, to throw John in jail. She wanted him dead. But Herod wasn't quite so sure. You see, Herod wanted it both ways. Herod really liked to listen to John. He said a lot of stuff that made a lot of sense. But whenever John would get a little bit too close to his sin, whenever John would get a little bit too close to the real problem, his corrupt heart, he would just take John and put him back in prison. I just won't listen to you anymore, John. He wanted to listen to him, but he didn't want to listen to it. And he kept this little game going back and forth, much to the anger of his wife. So now it's birthday time. You would have thought that these people were Missouri Synod Lutherans because the men are in one room and the women are in another. Well, it's not for that reason. Because no decent, respectable woman would be in the room where the men are at. You see, that's the kind of party that's going on. Not good. Not clean. Not wholesome. And any woman that would be in that room would be the kind that would be putting dollar bills in places that we really don't want to talk about. So what happens? Herodias' daughter from the first marriage is brought in to dance. I don't need to tell you what kind of dance. At the end of the dance, King Herod is pleased. So pleased that he's ready to divorce his wife and marry Salome, the daughter, the stepdaughter. I'll give you up to half my kingdom. That's what that means. We'll get rid of mom. You and me, baby.
And the young girl doesn't know what to do. She can be the queen. Oh, yeah, but there's mom there. I'll go ask mom what to do. And mom sees the opportunity. King Herod has made all of these braggadocious boasts in front of his guests. Soon, the execu executioner is on his way. This, this king, Herod, feared more about his reputation and what other people would think of him than doing the right thing. John is dead. His head is on the platter. The message has been silenced because the messenger has been silenced. And John the Baptist, stone cold body, is placed in a tomb. Kind of a bizarre reading for a summer Saturday night in Nebraska, isn't it? But remember, this text is not primarily about birthday parties. It's not primarily about Herod and Herodias and Salome and the dance of shame. It's not even primarily about John the Baptist. Remember the first verse? King Herod heard of it for Jesus' name had become known. This text is comparing Jesus and Herod. Herod, a would-be, wannabe king. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh. King Herod, who, who wanted to be powerful, and yet, when it really came time for him to exert his power, he cowered in weakness. Jesus, who has behind him, in him, and through him all power in heaven and on earth, and yet, for your sake and mine, choose to hold back that power. For our sakes, he became weak so that we would be strong. He humbled himself unto death even death on a cross to bring us life and life everlasting. King Herod, he, he vacillated back and forth. He wasn't really sure who to please. He wasn't even sure of his own identity. Jesus Christ I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door for the sheep. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep only to pick it up again. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? My friends, wherever the Word of God is proclaimed in its truth and purity, there are only two reactions that can actually happen. Are you ready for this? There are only two. When the Word of God goes forth in its truth and purity, people either believe it or they reject it. People either love it or they hate it. People embrace it or they try to destroy it. It's one or the other. And anybody that tries to ride the fence, every, anybody like King Herod that tries to vacillate back and forth, ultimately will deny, reject, persecute, and kill the message and the messenger. John the Baptist, he's dead. But you know what? His voice continues. His voice continues. You know, every time we sing the liturgy, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. You know where that comes from?
comes from? Well, it comes from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit through the lips of John the Baptist. John the Baptist doing his baptizing thing. One day, John chapter 1, Jesus comes walking by. John points at him and says, Aha! Behold! Looky there! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you realize that every time the gospel is proclaimed, it is that message of John the Baptist going forth? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Every time Pastor Burt and soon Pastor Hale proclaim that message here, it is that message of God, that message of John the Baptist proclaiming Jesus, the Lamb of God. The message goes forth. Praise be to God. From the outside looking in, you know what you folks here at Zion West have? Pastor Burt, Pastor Hale, as far as I'm concerned, that is the dream team of pastors right here. But guess what? There will be times when your pastors, being faithful to the Word of God, will proclaim a message hurts, that stings, that makes you angry, because it will be calling you to repent. Maybe like in our text, it'll be something with some sort of sexual deviancy or incest or divorce or I don't know. Maybe it would be something completely different. God's word is both law and gospel. And because God loves sinners like you and me and does not want us to become secure in our sins, he sends faithful messengers to proclaim the whole counsel of God. The law is like a hammer that crushes a proud and sinful heart. And once that heart is crushed and broken, then the sweet, life-giving, life-changing gospel comes forth. Create in me a new heart, a clean heart, O oh God. My friends, God has given us His Word. His Word that has been placed in broken vessels, cracked pots, if you will. Pastors, pastors who are not out to win friends and influence people. We're not seeking to get on an episode of the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Who are not primarily concerned about dollars and seats. But who have been called to be faithful to Christ and His Word. For all of those times, we have not warmly embraced the message that God has brought to us through His messengers. For all of the times we have failed to listen to the message and really wanted to take it out on the messenger. For all of the times we've been weak and vacillating. Not knowing really where, whether we wanted to hear God's word or not. And even for all those times, and because we didn't like the word, we hated the message and the messenger. For all these sins and more. Remember? It's all about Jesus. Jesus has lived a perfect life for you. His righteousness is yours. Jesus has bled and died. Your substitute on Calvary's cross. Taking the hit for the sins that we have committed. Jesus 
has paid the penalty in full. It is finished. And to give us power to be better than we can be on our own, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, puts that resurrection power inside of us at our back. And now our baptism cries forth just like John the Baptist. The baptismal font is like a beacon going out. Come, return, die and drown with all of your sin and lusts and evil passions and rise forth a new person, a new creation, ready to live for and in Jesus Christ today and forever. I don't know when your next birthday celebration will be. Mine's in just a few days. It'll be pretty hard not to think about this one from Mark chapter 6. But remember, it's not about us. It's always, first and foremost, about Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts, our minds, the message and the messenger in Christ Jesus our Lord.